Well, good morning, Johns Creek Baptist Church on this Pentecost Sunday where Christians around the world are remembering God's gift of Holy Spirit to us as a further reminder that we don't have to do all this on our own, that God's presence goes with us and abides in us. Hopefully that will give us some strength, some renewed energy as we make our way through these words of Jesus known or encapsulated in the Sermon on the Mount, these powerful words that in many ways convict us and guide us, encourage us and direct us, and how can we not but walk this way up the mountain, if you will, uh, and beyond. Once again, thank you for the the privilege and honor to, to be here with you during this summer's journey. Uh, last week and all of my gushing of gratitude I actually (laughs) failed to say the most obvious which is and here I'm going to put on my Mercer hat on behalf of Mercer University and the McAfee School of Theology and here I'm being quite serious thank you for the ways you have believed and invested and served our School of Theology from the very beginning Rhonda, I'm looking forward to not only getting to know you as the executive assistant to the pastor and now associate pastor, one of the pastors of this this congregation, but Rhonda's going to be our student this coming year, and we're excited about you teaching us a thing or two about ministry. We look forward to learning with you. This is just one of the many ways in which you as a congregation Uh, share with us in our mission to prepare ministers who will inspire the church and the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Forgive me for not mentioning that last week, but please know of my gratitude uh, that we're all in this this helpful partnership together. Now, I kept up with, uh, I keep up with the sermons that come from this place uh, in the course of any given year. I'm not one of these that listens to every sermon of Every pastor I know in the Atlanta area, that would be impossible. Who has that kind of time? But I was very intrigued with a series of messages that Pastor Sean brought, Losing My Religion. I don't know if you know this or not, but it reached quite the buzz, not just locally or throughout the state, but literally all over. And I was one of those happy congregants listening alongside and learning alongside with you. So you already know this, that is that it seems that church has kind of lost its way a little bit, at least in North America. It's not like things used to be. Of course, what were things uh, and how were did they used to be? We could make that conversation, right? But it's true. It's true that the typical church in North America is not nearly as influential, not nearly as credible, not nearly as impactful when it comes to meeting some of the very real global challenges that we face. You've heard and read about all of the data and all of the research. I'm not going to repeat any of that today. There's no need. You get it. I get it. We we know it and are often reminded about it. But if you think the church is struggling today in North America in the 21st century, pay attention to the Gospels and the first century gathering. Join with me around that mountain as this son of a carpenter, uncredentialed, I might add, calls together not the brightest and the best, but those that have struggled and languish of being validated in the world in which they live, this this society of peasants and laborers, this gathering of uh, of fellow Hebrews who were often dominated by a, 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 a hostile government and silence to the point of death. Friends at Johns Creek Baptist Church and anyone else that may be watching or listening, we got nothing on them. They were nobodies, insignificant. And then Jesus sat down, because that's what preachers did back then. (laughs) He sat down and he started saying things that were crazy. You heard it last week. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who persecute you. 
And then, and then he said something even more remarkable. And if you got your Bibles, follow along with me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. If not, just simply follow along and listen and hear. Jesus said to them, you are the salt of the earth. But if a salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. These are God's words for God's people. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we have opened the doors of your house. And so our prayer continues to be that you open our minds that we may think critically with the mind of Christ Open our hearts that we may love compassionately with the love of Christ. And open our, li- our, our, our lives that we may serve mercifully in the very name of Christ. For this we offer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now we've got a few people here this morning that actually work with me. Paul, Paul Berg being one of them. Uh, my colleague, uh, Amanda Burton, uh, and her husband, I don't mean to isolate people, but visiting from Smoke Rise Baptist Church, so y'all be sure to treat her and her husband, Alan, very nicely. They're here. Um, Others, perhaps, y'all, and I need to apologize, have heard me complain all week, all week about this sermon. (laughs) By now you're thinking, why didn't I just go to my lake house? <laughs> but I complain all week because, I mean, here I am about to preach on a text of Scripture that I know, I know, I know you have heard before. How many Sunday school lessons? Every time you have a baptism, like I observed last week, you're reminded you're salt, you're light, go out and let your light shine. What can I possibly add to this text? And, and so, and, 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 It's also kind of problematic, and what I mean by that is we're a little confused about salt. Let's just start there. I mean, from the very earliest memory I have, and and I know that nutritionists will will correct me, but the the message I heard was, well, salt's bad. I mean, watch your salt. I mean, even as a kid, you're thinking, I don't know about this salt stuff, but you got to stay away from it. Of course, that never stopped my grandmother. But salt, too much salt, too much salt, a, a bad thing here. And, and I know that when I've had a little too much salt in my diet, you know, my wedding band gets a little snug here. Can't maybe not get it off as, as easily. Uh, salt. Uh, but, but then I'm a, I'm a cooking show nerd. I mean, my wife likes to watch SEC football, and I like to watch the, the cooking shows on PBS. I mean, that's okay. We're good with that. We've been married 35 years. We figured out how to make this work here. And, and, and salt, well, salt's a lot different these days than in Eatonton, Georgia, at the grocery store where you had only two kinds of salt, the kind you, you would put in a salt shaker and rock salt that you'd make homemade ice cream by. But today, oh, my goodness, try picking out salt sometime. There's Himalayan salt. There's green salt. There's pink salt. There's artisanal salt. You know what artisanal salt is, don't you? It's expensive. That's what it is. <laughs> So what do we do with salt? Uh, A a few years ago, uh, someone gave to me a book uh, all about salt, you know, its history and so forth. It's by the title, Salt. (laughs) And I read about half of it. It's not because it was poorly written. It was an excellently written book, but I only read about half of it because it was it was about salt people. I mean, that's, you know, let's just be honest with you. How interesting can we make it? So, so I bring a bit of this anxiety as we open up scripture into this room to hear the obvious. I mean, yeah, he also talked about light for sure. Light we know only works in the context of darkness. At least that's according to basic laws of physics, but I don't need to elaborate about that one. Do I? So, so part of me this morning, looking at my time here, part of me this morning wants to say, okay, all right, 
Y'all know this gospel lesson. If you've been in church more than two weeks, you've heard this before. So go be salt. Go be light. Go, go do these things. Let's have the hymn of invitation and go home and leave church early. And I will be remembered as the greatest preacher that ever came to Johns Creek Baptist Church. Was that money? Was that my Okay. <laughs> there was more amens on that one than anything I've heard. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus said. Go back if you have your Bibles open. Go back and look at, at verse 13 and, and following. Jesus didn't tell us go be salt, go be light. What does the scriptures tell us? You, oh, I love this congregation. You are the salt. You are the light. And not just you, but all y'all. This is not about trying harder. This is not about how much more effort can I bring to this. This is not about opening up your journal and taking copious notes on what the preacher or the professor or the teacher is trying to help unpack about this, these verses of Scripture. Oh, my goodness. Don't you hear what it is? It's a gift. It's a grace. It's an affirmation that God has given you everything you need. You are the salt. You are the light. Let your light shine. Oh, and that is grace. It's God's gift to fishermen and financiers, to disciples and to deadbeats, to followers and folks on the fringes. You, all of you, and, and, and me too, are a gift of God. Blessed, to borrow from last week's sermon. Blessed. And as God's gift, you, you make a difference with your life, your unique, wonderful, magnificent life. Blessed and blessing and blessing. Now, this has social implications, doesn't it? I mean, you just can't sit around and see some wrong being done or someone being hurt or someone that is hurt and just sit on the sideline. Salt and light can't do that. This has ecclesial implications. Now, more than ever, it's, in, it's imperative that good church folk discover the, the grace of what it means to genuinely love one another and, and behaving as if somehow God has made a difference in who we are and therefore how can we not be different to one another that's the thing I love about church it's one of the few places where folks from different political ideologies I imagine that's true here in this church different persuasions different socioeconomic backgrounds uh, different ethnicities different family origin stories where we can somehow come in one place and actually be together and we're actually better when we can do that salt and light Give you a quick Greek lesson here. The you here throughout this sermon, and in particular this passage, the you here is y'all. Seriously. <laughs> it's in the Greek plural, y'all. Jesus was a southerner. I know that. But it's also a reminder that the Sermon on the Mount is not a private devotional, but a communal commitment. In other words, salt and light doesn't happen in the privacy of our own spaces. I was reminded of, uh, of a recent article in the New York Times about the value of showing up in the lives of others. And the, the columnist was talking about redwoods and sequoias. And I, my mind immediately went back five years ago, this very month. Five years ago, my youngest son uh, graduated from college. This is the the father of my grandson. Do I need to show that picture again? I, I can do that. I mean, 
anyway, he graduated college, and so we went hiking as a graduation present to him, and certainly for me, we went hiking and backpacking through uh, Sequoia National Park and Yosemite, and for a couple of days, we camped beneath uh, the sequoias, and, and y'all know all of the stories about the sequoias and redwoods, the most massive tree in all of the world. There's no way to actually convey what that is like to, to sleep beneath the stars in this magnificent grove grove because you see sequoias and redwoods they don't grow all on their own their root system is shallow we saw several that were overturned in some cases centuries ago and their root system is comparatively shallow to the mass of the tree rather they grow and grows because their roots move out long and broad and tangled together and I love how the columnist described it as bound together in obligation. Bound together in obligation. If that's not church, grits ain't groceries, brothers and sisters. <laughs> in fact, what's interesting in this article, it made some of those very points. As salt, well, they didn't use salt and light, but I'm saying as salt and light... The significance is in when it's companioned with others. Just as with food and, and, and darkness, salt and light enhance uh, and illuminate. So we are living into created purpose when we find ourselves in the company of others showing up for one another. And so for our purposes at, at JCBC, this means a couple of things. The, the first is that we are, salt, we are to be salt and light to each other. We're, we're always, 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 to quote the musician Jack Johnson, better together. We may not always be our best individual selves, but collectively, collectively we are zesty and we radiate. The article from the New York Times, I want to quote a portion of it to you, and I'm breaking a cardinal rule in preaching, and that is I don't like to quote per se, but, but I found it interesting because this was coming out of a Times piece. The author writes, researchers have found that people who go to religious services repeatedly are healthier and live longer. In 2016, the Journal of American Medical Association published the results of a study that surveyed some 75,000 women for 20, uh, for 20 years and found that those who attended religious services more than once a week had a 33% lower mortality risk compared to those who never attended. Now, this was in a Times piece. They weren't concerned with promoting church. The author was actually just simply pointing out that we're in a culture that is becoming increasingly isolated and lonely and furthermore with the, the decline in religious observances it's coming at a cultural and physical loss we are salt and light not by privatized acts of piety but when we show up in each other's lives bound in obligation to one another and it comes in the form of casseroles for the grieving, handshakes and hugs of welcome when you walk in the door, prayer concerns lifted up in your Sunday school class. We remind each other that, yeah, life, and you were doing a little bit of this money in the worship service. It's a reminder that, yeah, you know, I don't have it all together. Or my family's a mess, or I'm worried about paying bills, or whatever it might be, but you... You come here. And that's when salt and light makes the difference. Don't go be it. <laughs> you, you are it. Salt and light is that we are enhanced and illuminated when we gather together week after week. But, but also salt and light is that, when, that we are enhanced and illuminated when we show up for others beyond the walls of this church. You knew I had to go there, right? We're not a private enterprise, and I know you know that. 
I know you know that because Pastor Terry Bird just came back from Kenya, just kind of representing in a very literal way. After 31 hours of traveling from Kenya back to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, I believe it was on Thursday, she's sitting right here today. If she nods off, let her sleep it out. She's earned that. But she goes on behalf of the church not to give to Kenya something they need or that something Johns Creek is providing, but rather as salt and light to remind the respective nations, hey, we are in this together. And we cannot neglect our brothers and sisters even halfway around the world any more than they want to neglect the brothers and sisters right here in Johns Creek, Alpharetta area of Georgia. Now let's think about this very literally for just a, just a few remaining moments. Salt on its own is not something we desire. You don't just sit down at the table and say, I'll have a bowl of salt, please, thank you. Um, just thinking out loud for a moment, why not ask the question, what is God asking us to be or to become in light of needs around us? See, this is a day and age in which folks are looking that, that actually gives me encouragement as I work at a school of theology preparing ministers. Is I think now more than ever, folks, folks are looking, they're searching. And so how we respond as salt and light makes all of the difference to enhance and to illuminate. They hunger for wonder and for awe and for a, for a sense of more, enhancing the lives around us. It's a wondrous thought, isn't it? Salt enhances, salt enlivens, salt makes the other better. Light illuminates, light brightens, light sets you free to be and see. Does that describe you? One author put it this way, not a one of us is made to be hidden. Now, I don't want to convict our, our introverts. You don't have to be an extrovert in order to abide by the Sermon on the Mount here. you just got to be how God created you to be and know that and trust that that's actually more than enough. So, um, my great uncle, uh, Robert Deloach, the brother of my grandfather, Clark Deloach, well, let me say a thing about the Deloaches. They've been the best that I can tell in middle Georgia, uh, Putnam County area since the 1830s, we think, more or less. Always farming. Nothing but farmers, as a matter of fact. Robert, though, in the 1940s, left the dairy farm, which, for the record, I understand. I did the same thing, you know, a few decades later. And because it was the 1940s, uh, was drafted into the military because he was no longer farming, providing for the goods of the nation. Robert uh, was in the infantry and served in the army uh, and was marching from uh, literally through, uh, through Germany. And I never met Robert, neither did my father. But we thought we've known Robert. Robert would write letters home. And some of you may be familiar with the term V-mails. When you were serving, especially in World War II, you would write your letter. Uh, the United States Army would make a photocopy of it, reduce it, redact it from sensitive information. And then once it met the censor's uh, check, it would then go to the uh, respective families. And Robert would talk about everything from how much he appreciated the, the pecans sent through the mail and how they finally reached his encampment. One email he talks about that he's had a real good two weeks where he's staying. He's literally staying in a barn right beside a house, which he thought was kind of funny. He left the farm life to only be sheltered in a farm, which wasn't too bad in the dead of winter. Robert wrote often, lovingly, about my dad, who was at the time three years old. But like I said, I, I never knew Robert. Neither did my dad. He never made it home. In February of 1945, in the Rural River Engagement, 
We're not sure by the details. But his body came home a year later, draped in a flag, with much press attention from the Eatonton Messenger because he was the first body to be brought home from Putnam County. I share that story to just simply say, here I am in a pulpit, or more or less, a pulpit in Johns Creek, 80 years later, talking about someone I never knew, never met, but heard stories by my grandmother, read the V-mails, and someone that I look forward to maybe one day just understanding a little bit better. Salt and light is not about having to say something clever or particularly insightful. It's about trusting that when you show up, and this is going to sound predictable, but work with me here. When you show up, believe it or not, God shows out in the simple and unassuming ways of just who you are. This isn't just about personal piety. I've said that already. It's about this church. Because I know if you're like any other church that I've either pastored or served in the interim capacity or visited, I know you've got anxieties. It comes with it. Who knows what the future of the church will be? But I know this. There is a future. So, Lean into the truth of the gospel if you want to believe the words of Jesus, and I highly recommend it. You are the salt, and you are the light. So, let's go out and let our light shine that they may give glory to God. As we prepare to respond, however God may be leading you, We've got pastors here that will be happy to talk with you about whatever is needed. Maybe you just need prayer. And so, because you've shown up, we're going to show up for you. Maybe it's to understand what does it mean to be a part of this church. There's no secret to church membership. And, and, and one of these pastors will be more than happy to, to kind of guide you in what that looks like to be a member of Johns Creek Baptist Church. Maybe it's just simply... Uh, letting these pastors know that you're praying for them because it can be a pretty lonely spot when you're the one with reverend in your title. But however God is working as we prepare to bring this service to conclusion, let your light shine. Be the salt and the, and the light. Let us pray. Lord, you've given so much to us enhancing our lives, illuminating our pathways. And now our prayer is simple. Remind us of the sacred inheritance we all hold. Let us lean firmly into the belief of your words. You are, that, that is that we are the salt and we are the light. And now, Lord, the world awaits for what will shine forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace.